Hola, konnichiwa, guten Abend, bonjour, hello to wherever you are in the world. And uh, my name is Andrew Wright, and I'm from Melbourne in Australia. Uh, I'm here today to talk about using SharePoint to build a Wikipedia-like system within your enterprise. Uh, before I get started, just a couple of interesting things you might not know about Melbourne. The first uh, feature movie ever made was made here in Melbourne in uh, 1906 about a guy called Ned Kelly. He was a famous um, bush ranger or gangster, I guess you might call him, or an outlaw. Uh, also, Melbourne's the sporting capital of Australia. We have the Australian Tennis Open is here, the Grand Prix is here, and of course we've got our own Australian Rules Football. Anyone ever comes to Melbourne, make sure you you've support a team when you come here. Everyone here is obsessed with football. And uh, just finally, there's a TV show called Neighbours, which is shown in more than 50 countries around the world. That's uh, filmed here in Melbourne. They have Neighbours tours if you're looking for something to do when you're in Melbourne. And uh, more than 120 million people a day watch this TV show, which I find incredible since it's such a such bad acting. <laughs> anyway, just a few things about Melbourne. Okay, so let's get started now with this uh, presentation. Just a little bit about uh, myself, first of all. Uh, I started a, this thing called the Worldwide Internet Challenge uh, a few years ago now. It allows organizations to benchmark their intranets. Uh, now half of those intranets have, uh, have been built using SharePoint. So a lot of the lessons learned, a lot of the findings that I'm going to share with you today are relevant to SharePoint. Uh, the other thing I'm probably known for is that I manage the two largest groups on LinkedIn about intranets. So there's Internet Professionals and the other one's the Worldwide Internet Challenge. So I'm just going to give you a few seconds now to go and join those groups <laughs> because, uh, well, it's well worth it. I'm just kidding, of course. Um, but I would recommend uh, joining those groups. Uh, there's no spam. There's lots of good discussions going on and it would certainly help you with your uh, in SharePoint intranet implementation. Uh, and what I do for my, my day job is uh, my consultant, I help organizations ma make the most of their SharePoint or intranet uh, implementation. You can see my contact details there. Feel free to follow me on Twitter at RooJWright. I'll explain some other day why that's such a weird name. And uh, you can see my other details there. Okay, so what I'm going to do today, uh, this session is essentially into three parts. Uh, the first part is I'm going to talk about some of the research from the Worldwide Internet Challenge. I'm going to tell you a bit more about that in a minute. So that's the, the first part of this session. The second session is I'm going to go through a methodology or an approach uh, for developing a Wikipedia-like system for organizations uh, that I found addresses a lot of the issues that I've found through all this research. And the third part of this um, session will be an actual demonstration of how uh, an inter, let's call it an intra wiki, uh, a Wikipedia within an organization, how it might look implemented using SharePoint 2013 foundation. So I'll go through and show you an actual example. Okay, so there'll be three parts. One, we look at the research. Two, we look at a methodology. Three, we then look at an example. Okay, so that's the plan. So first of all, what is the worldwide internet? Just a bit more information about it. Um, it's a, it's a free service. It's a web-based survey that internet managers or SharePoint managers send out to their staff. It's available in 13 different languages. Uh, it's supported by a partnership around the world. There's about 15 different partners in different countries and it's free. Organizations do it because they want to find out whether their internet is uh, any good or not or what areas they should focus on to improve. Um, some companies also use it uh, as the basis of putting a business case together to get some funding to improve the internet and also um, you can identify or learn tips and trips, tricks from other organizations who have participated and ranked well. So more than 50,000 people now uh, from around the world have done it which makes it the, the largest study of internet end user satisfaction in the world. Uh, more than 190 organizations now have participated in 23 countries. Uh, some of the bigger organizations include Nestle, there's Emirates, British Gas, British Gas sorry, Deloitte and Coca-Cola. Uh, but it's open to any organization of any size in any industry. So we've had organizations with less than 100 people who have participated and organizations as well with more than 100,000 people. So it's open to any organization that has an internet and as I mentioned it's free. 
So if you're interested in doing it, just worldwide or www.worldwideinternetchallenge.com and you'll find out uh, some more information there. Okay, so from all of this research and all these participants, what have we found? What have I, what have I found? The most interesting finding is shown in this chart here. So there are four questions on the survey which ask people how often they contribute content to the internet, how often they publish content, how often they discuss work topics, how often they collaborate online, how often they provide feedback. You can see the blue area there, in each of those cases it's more than 50%, probably more around the 55% mark. So that's saying 55% of people never publish content, discuss work topics, collaborate online or provide feedback. So that's more than half, that's a big percentage. The red area there, which is around 25 to 30% are infrequent people that contribute content or infrequent uh, content publishers. So that's a couple of times a year. Then working our way up to the top, the light blue area, are people that uh, publish content more than once a day. So you've got maybe 2 or 3% who publish more than once a day. To me, this is a huge problem with SharePoint and a huge opportunity for organizations that can actually increase that percentage of people contributing content. So this data is supported by Jacob Nielsen, who's a web usability guru. He wrote a book uh, a while ago, which sold many thousands of copies. Uh, he bases a lot of his findings on research, and he did some research about eight years ago, where he concluded in most online communities, so we could call it use SharePoint or an intranet in there, 90% of users are lurkers who never contribute, 9% of users contribute a little, and 1% of users account for almost all of the action. So this is fairly similar to my findings, uh, although in my case, uh, instead of 90% of users being lurkers, it's more around the probably the 55, 60% mark. But it's a similar finding. There's only a very small percentage of people who are contributing uh, contributing content. Now, why is this a problem, and why should we be trying desperately to do something about it? This is a another diagram from my research. What it shows is the relationship between how interactive the internet is and how valuable the end users see it. So what this is saying is there's a very strong relationship between the how how often people contribute content and what value they perceive to be of the internet. So just quickly the on the left hand vertical column there, it's the internet value, how valuable is the internet. Uh, across the bottom horizontal axis is how interactive the internet is. So this is, is mapping the relationship between the two and you can see the, the correlation there for any statistical people who are listening is 0.4444 which is a strong correlation. In fact out of all the questions, there's about 40 odd questions in the survey, how interactive the internet is, is has the strongest correlation with internet value, meaning it's the most important thing in terms of delivering a valuable in internet. Now just to contrast this with finding information, this is a scattered a good diagram as well. Again, you've got the internet value across the, the left hand vertical column there, but down below, these are the scores for finding information. So you can see again, there's a correlation between how easy it is to find information and internet value, but it's nowhere near as strong as the interactivity. So we've got 0.1383 there, you'll see. So I'm just showing you this as a contrast as to how important it is to uh, deliver an interactive intranet. So if we can agree, and my research uh, provides a fairly clear indication that getting people to actually contribute content is the most important thing in terms of delivering a valuable SharePoint implementation, then we have to look at reasons why this is not happening, why it's the case. <coughs> now there's a lot of articles around and there's a lot of angst around about why enterprise social networks or social media in the workplace or social intranets, whatever you want to call it, why it's not taking off within the workplace. And there's fairly uh, clear agreement among a lot of people, there's, I did a search, there's, there's over 30 articles I found about uh, reasons why our intranets aren't becoming more interactive in the workplace, and I've summarized them into these six key topics. So lack of executive support, uh, this not only is there not enough funding or resources to help implement these programs, but perhaps more importantly, the, they're not setting examples. So there's not a culture of knowledge sharing or collaboration. Um, it, 
the, the leaders within an organization are not setting an example. And this is partially to do with the business case not being clear. So when you've got these online tools and people are communicating, uh, it can be difficult to put a, a clear business case together explaining what the value is. And this is related to the perception that we're looking at Facebook within the organization. Uh, people are just wasting their time, they're just chatting to their friends. Now they may be building very important relationships, productive relationships, they may, may be solving problems, they may be becoming more engaged because of all this communication, but there is still a perception that it's not a productive use of time. Then of course we have security issues. If we give our staff the ability to publish anything at any time, they're all going to criticize the CEO, they're going to criticize our strategy, they're going to go crazy and there'll be trouble everywhere. <laughs> so. Uh, this also can uh, present prevent barriers. Uh, again, related to this, uh, there's no incentive. So if I'm the, the, the gun programmer within an organization or I'm the best salesperson within an organization, where is the incentive for me to contribute content? Um, I'm probably getting paid a lot. I'm getting recognition. I've got status of being the best programmer. Why should I be helping my colleagues? So there needs to be incentives as well in place, and uh, these are it's, uh, for contributing content. And there aren't too many organisations who have gone down this path yet. And the final category, uh, there's a potential shift in power. So what I mean by this, in traditional organisations where there's a hierarchy, it's generally years of experience, politics get involved, people gradually work their way up the top. If now we're giving people the ability to write blogs, to get followers, to provide uh, knowledge to the rest of the organization, it's actually possible for an intern or you know, some unlikely person to contribute significantly to the organization and uh, begin to gain some power. Now, people who are in, or in power may see this as a bit of a threat. So it's just something to keep in mind. And I've come across this situation once or twice myself in my consulting career that um, People who are in power are very reluctant to upset the status quo. Okay, so now these are all very good reasons, but um, I want to talk about two more reasons that I've discovered through my research about why internets, social internets, SharePoint are not being used and people aren't contributing more content more often. Okay, what I'm showing you here is one of the survey questions which says how important are the following in contributing to a valuable internet and you've got seven different options from the the highest option on the left hand side and the lowest or the, the least important quality is on the right hand side now remember this survey is completed by end users so it's not completed by SharePoint managers or internet managers communications managers completed by people that actually use the tools so you'll notice on the left hand side, the top, the most important quality is ease of finding information. So the, the blue area there indicates how critical that quality is to a valuable intranet. And we can see there that ease of finding information is the most important. Now, that's perhaps not so too surprising. What is surprising to me is the other end of the scale, at the right hand side, staff able to contribute and interact is the lowest. So it's the least important quality of a valuable internet according to end users. It's even less important than the look and feel. <laughs> so what I find interesting about that is it sends a clear message that employees aren't that interested in contributing content. They're happy to find it, they're happy to use it, but they don't want to actually be the ones contributing content. And certainly from my consulting experience, I've come across this a lot, trying to get people, encourage them to contribute content, to write up their processes. Uh, it's often a, a thankless task. So using, using this clue, what can we then do about it? Now again, based on my research, what I also do with uh, organizations that participate in the survey, those organizations that rank well, and there are some organizations out there that have a high level of participation from their staff. So what I'll actually do is contact those organizations and find out the reason for their success. So I'll, I'll find out what process they went through, how they've managed to get people to contribute content, and I'll do that for all the questions. So what I found, and this is a summary of the top five tips that I've learned, uh, after talking with those managers of the successful SharePoint intranets. 
you need content evangelists. So you need influential people within your organization, the CEO, preferably senior management as well, um, thought leaders in the different business units. You need them contributing content. Maybe they write a weekly blog or they provide uh, tips and tricks. Perhaps there's some sort of useful content that they can contribute regularly to help set the example. Now, I also did a bit of research about Wikipedia, why Wikipedia became successful when other global encyclopedias failed. One of the main reasons was that Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, was a content evangelist. So he contacted well-known people and got them to contribute and then the snowball effect happened and we have Wikipedia today, which some people argue is, you know, has its problems, but still it's the leading encyclopedia in the world and I'm sure everyone listening has used Wikipedia at some stage. Again, uh, learning from Wikipedia as well as organisations that, that rate well in terms of getting their staff to contribute, you need an easy to use platform. So people should be able to do something within a few minutes, make edits on the run. Uh, again, using Wikipedia, I went in there myself, it took me about 10 minutes to learn how to update an article. I went, I updated an article, there it was, it appeared there, everyone in the world could then see my comments. Now there is a self-review process that occurs with Wikipedia where other people can come in and make changes, so I just can't go in there, you know, willy-nilly and, <laughs> and uh, making comments. They'll get picked up pretty quickly. But to actually update the content is a relatively quick and painless process. So this needs to happen within the organization as well. Content approval needs to be simple. Now, as a consultant, I've worked with organizations where they really put barriers up towards people contributing content. Everything needs to be approved before it can be published. Now, this puts people off from publishing. You may get a better quality of content, but you're also losing a lot of valuable content because people just can't be bothered going through that process. So you'd need to consider your content approval process, um, how, how complicated it is and whether it's a barrier to preventing people from contributing content. Community events. The, the internet managers I, I spoke to, without exception, they all have a strong authoring community. So they meet face to face regularly. They ask people to give demonstrations of the latest projects they've been working on. They have a, an online workspace set up, so they actually set the example themselves. They have regular reporting, uh, regular training sessions as well. So there's a really strong community um, around those organizations with, with good content contributions. And the final uh, quality I've noticed in these organizations is their incentives uh, and people are rewarded. Now, it may not be a financial incentive, it could be just recognition. I've seen uh, one organization who published the top three blog posts on the home page. So they had a lot of people contributing blog posts. Those that were most popular, that got read the most, would appear on the home page. And of course, the people that wrote those blogs got the recognition. So it was a great way for those people to build up um, some, some power and some authority within an organization. So um, I do, I've presented at a number of conferences and workshops as well, and I often ask the question, who has incentives within their organization for people to contribute content? Rarely does anyone put their hand up, so it's not common at all. There's, there's a lot of talk about gamification and incentives, but in practice, um, I haven't seen it too much. And this comes back to senior management support as well. You need HR involved as well, um, but a great way to get people more involved in contributing content. Now, I mentioned before that uh, I showed a number of reasons why social intranets or enterprise social networks or, or SharePoint weren't gaining traction within an organization. I said there were two other reasons I wanted to talk about. One is um, people just really don't want to contribute content. Now, the second reason is, one of the reasons for that is they don't know what they should be contributing. So it's not clear what type of content people should contribute. Now I've done some more research and I've identified there are broad, nine broad content types that can be used with SharePoint. These are structured content, your lists, so that could be a staff list, a product list, a supplier list. Then there's your how-to content, procedures, processes, how to do things. Then you've got your forms, your tools, your templates, your applications. Is another type. Then you've got documents that can be reused. These could be project plans or business cases, you know, that you can modify a few words and you can reuse them again or repurpose. Then you've got news and blogs. 
you've got uh, collaboration, discussion forums, team sites, online spaces. Then you've got reference material, so examples might be case studies or white papers, so information that doesn't get changed but, but can be useful for various processes. Then you've got reports, performance measures, KPIs, dashboards, that sort of information. And finally, the ninth type of inter, uh, internet content type is archives or records, different copies of the same document. That last type, incidentally, um, is probably better ways to manage that than using your intranet. <laughs> but uh, we'll talk about that another time. Right, so out of those nine different internet content types or SharePoint content types, uh, which one is the most important? Okay, there are three that are equally important. And you can see these on the left-hand side of the chart. So the chart sorts these content types from most important on the left to the least important on the right. So on the left, we've got structured content, we've got how-to type information, and we've got forms, tools, and templates. They're the three most useful types of content that your SharePoint can um, manage. Now, interestingly, you'll notice uh, roughly in the middle there, you've got news and blogs, which is about the middle most important information. Now, what's interesting about that is most SharePoint intranets, what do you see on the front page? Nothing but news. <laughs> you see announcements, you see department news, company news, news from around the world, news is everywhere. Now, it's unfortunate this has happened in my view. Uh, as this type of information, although it's useful, it's perhaps not the most important type. So perhaps we should have some, you know, some common phone numbers or some common forms, that sort of information on the front page. Okay, so that's all I wanted to share with you in terms of, of research uh, that I found of this study of internet or SharePoint end users. So the, just to reiterate, so the, the two most interesting things, one is that um, having an interactive internet or a SharePoint implementation is the most important thing you can do in terms of having a, a successful implementation. And secondly, people are very reluctant to do that. Uh, they don't really want to get involved. They don't want to uh, contribute online or to be engaged. One of the reasons for that is they're not exactly sure what they should be doing. So the type of content they should be contributing is not clear. So that's the first part of the session. Now the second part that I want to talk about now is a methodology or an approach I've put together to address these concerns. So I've just, I'm going to call it an intra wiki. So it's like a Wikipedia or a slash between Wikipedia and an internet <laughs> intra wiki. Okay, now I've done this for a few organizations and these are the, the, top, the top phases. There's eight phases that we go through and they're not necessarily sequential though in this diagram, that's how they're shown. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly explain what's involved in, in each of these phases. After I've done that, I'm going to show you through a SharePoint 2013 example of how an intro uh, wiki looks. All right, so the first phase is the baseline to find out where we're at the moment. So how, how SharePoint is supporting the company key performance indicators, how it supports operations, innovation and employee engagement within the organization. So we need to get an understanding of where we are now, where do we want to go and how we're going to get there. So just drilling a bit deeper, uh, again this is based on my my research of uh, you know the 200 odd organizations who have participated in the WIC. The successful intranets generally support three broad types of business imperatives and uh, I'm going to go through those now. So the first one is continuous improvement or innovation. So you'll get SharePoint supports that by having project sites, uh, team sites to, an, to allow people to implement new ideas or implement new projects that are going to uh, improve the organization. Uh, it also helps if you've got a a detailed employee directory so people can make these serendipitous connections so you get to know, meet people outside your immediate department <clears throat> so if you know someone that's interested in Java for example you can search those people's profiles maybe send that person an email or contact that person and you can build little communities within your organization and that helps for continuous improvement and innovation research has shown that these serendipitous connections or these um, unplanned connections uh, are great for um, initiating innovations and improvements within the organization. Other ideas, you may even have a, you know, like a page where people can actually suggest improvements as well. 
Now the second business imperative that a lot of organizations who have good intranets is operations. This is things like having workflow, having online forms, um, having centralized lists. So instead of having <clears throat> four or five staff directories, which you know most organizations seem to have, you have one central staff directory. So you consolidate that list, everyone singing from the same hymn book. Uh, we're familiar with workflow, so you fill out an online form, form, you click submit, it goes to the right person who then approves it, it then goes to the next person. It can make a lot of manual processes more efficient, and everyone always talks about the annual leave process, <laughs> where that can be streamlined using an internet. Well, there's a lot of processes uh, other than annual leave as well that can be also streamlined. Equipment ordering, um, providing help support, call center operations, there's a whole range of uh, manual tasks that use Word or PDF documents that can be streamlined using workflow. So that's another key area that a SharePoint uh, intranet can support. And the finally, the last area is employee engagement. <clears throat> There's a lot of research around that shows that people who are interested in and proud of the place that they work, they're more productive and the actual organization itself is more profitable. It can be up to 28% in some cases. So what can SharePoint or what can an intranet do to help increase employee engagement? Well, you can do things like um, having stories, news stories about the values of your organization or success stories or stories that are going to make people feel proud to work for that organization. You can also have uh, detailed staff directories so people can connect with each other. The more connected people are with their work colleagues, the more um, engaged they are at their organization. But perhaps the, the biggest contribution that SharePoint can make in terms of employee engagement is giving staff all the tools, all the information they need where they've got greater control over their working lives. So they could work from home potentially one or two days a week, they can work on the road, uh, they can work in pretty much any location at any time, giving them uh, a greater control over their own working uh, environment. <clears throat> so that's what I found with the organizations who, who rate well, who have good internets, who have good SharePoint internets, they're generally supporting one or more of these business imperatives. So continuous improvement, operations, or employee engagement. Right, so when you're baselining your internet or your, your SharePoint, this first step, you want to consider those three areas. How is SharePoint currently supporting operations, innovation, or employee engagement? Okay, now this, the second phase is to make sure your technology is okay, so that involves installing, setting up SharePoint, technical support, offsite and mobile access, managing capacity planning, etc. Now, I'm not going to talk about that much at all during this presentation. The, the technical track on SP24 covers a few of these topics. Alright, the next phase in uh, setting this intro wiki is to identify your content types creating lists and the metadata and the relationship between the lists. Now I'm going to show you an example shortly which will demonstrate what I'm talking about here but an example of a content type is a task or a procedure or a work instruction whatever you want to call it. So you would identify what content types you need and how they're related to each other. And I'll show you an example of that shortly. The next phase then is prototyping. So for every content type you've identified you need to create a template and an example of that content type. So here I've listed some content types that every organization will have. So you're going to have roles, you're going to have business units, you're going to have processes and probably tasks as well. There may be other content types as well, but they're your, your basic ones. And as I said, when I go through the example, I'm going to show you what a role page might look like and what a task page might look like. We haven't got time today to go through all of this, so but you'll get the general understanding. Uh, the, the next phase in setting up your intro wiki is to then extend this concept and you want to identify all your roles within your organization and what tasks those roles do, so kind of like job descriptions, the relevant me metadata um, around those tasks and organizational roles. Um, using personas is a good way to do this and the output from this phase is you'll have a list, probably a spreadsheet, of agreed roles and tasks within your organization. Okay, now we want to expand on the roles and tasks and put a bit more detail around it, so we want to develop a content plan. So we need to look at what content needs to support these tasks. Now the intro wiki model it's all based around tasks. You remember that previous diagram that I showed you the important content types one of the equally important ones was how to how to type content. So this is one of the most important content types <clears throat> that an organization can provide. 
So, um, <clears throat> so what we'll do in this content plan is we're going to identify the content that supports these tasks. So this could include lists, forms, templates, applications, tools, reusable content, reference material, reports, and work sites. Uh, it may include some websites as well. So this is all the content we need to support a particular task, and I'm going to illustrate this example in the demonstration shortly. So the output from this will again be a content development plan, probably another spreadsheet, or you could use a SharePoint list, why not? The next phase we need to look at is organizing our governance. So this is all about how SharePoint is going to be sustained. Uh, you could implement this as part of the prototype, prototype because essentially it's all about roles and responsibilities, who, who's doing what. So why not use a, a, a roles page and actually build it as part of your prototype to show how you're going to govern SharePoint. <clears throat> uh, now the other critical component of, this, of governance is change management training and uh, organizing proper job descriptions. <clears throat> My experience, this aspect, the change management and training component is the one that's most often overlooked and probably the biggest reason for SharePoint projects that fail. So there's no training given to, to people. People don't know what this SharePoint thing is, what they want to use it for. So there needs to be change management training. I've done, <laughs> I've, I remember one project that I worked on, a consulting project, where it was using SharePoint 2010. And really I had to sit down with the same people at least half a dozen times to explain the difference between using folders and using metadata. And I'm still not sure I got the point across at the end. So. Even though as a SharePoint professionals, we're very familiar with the concept of metadata and navigating in a number of different ways to find our, uh, to find the information. Uh, many people are familiar with the trad traditional paradigm of the folder structure and it's, it's very hard. That's just one example and there's many other examples as well. That, and the only way to overcome that is through change management training um, and just persistence really. <clears throat> Now the final aspect of setting up this intro wiki is looks at collaboration. So looking at how you're going to set up and promote discussion forums, how you're going to get people involved, how you're going to uh, manage those communities. Looks at document management as well. What sort of version control are you going to use? Are you going to use SharePoint for that, or are you going to have a separate document management system? I mentioned before the different content types. Um, <clears throat> quite often with with SharePoint and SharePoint intranets, uh, archiving is a big problem. So Organizations will leave all their old documents on there, which get mixed up with all the new documents. People that the documents that people need to read are mixed in with all the old documents that you don't want people to see. So by default, SharePoint ends up becoming a, a repository, an archive for, for old documents. Now, yes, you can use SharePoint for that, but it needs to be a separate function altogether. So you need to get all of those old documents, all that old stuff out of the road, out of your internet, and into a specific archive location. So that's collaboration. So you need to look at that as well as part of the, the intro wiki. So there, there are the eight uh, main phases um, at a fairly broad level. Now you can implement an intro wiki. You can get the basics set up, I believe, in uh, two to three weeks. Uh, now this is basically setting up your, your template, setting up the technical side of things. Of course, it doesn't involve creating all the content. It doesn't involve providing all the training. It uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't cover uh, sustaining the SharePoint usage. So obviously those things take a lot longer, but you can have the basics in place in from, from two to three weeks, I believe. Okay, so that's, <clears throat> that's the, the phases of developing uh, Wikipedia for your enterprise, uh, IntraWiki. So what I'm going to do now is give you some examples. So I'm going to go through four things. First of all, I'm going to create a wiki. So it's a how-to wiki. Remember that content type? The how-to was one of the most important content types. So we're going to go through and create a SharePoint 2013 wiki. Uh, we're going to add metadata or properties to that wiki, which is very important. I'm then going to show you how the typical end user would find that, that wiki once the metadata has been added. Uh, I'm going to show you then how to link to re a related topic. Uh, this resolves or solves the problem of breaking down the barriers within organizations by letting people know about um, other information that might be available that they might not have known about. And, uh, and then the final scenario that I'm going to go through is how a change is introduced to a process and how that might look like using a wiki. Alright, so the first thing I'm going to do is create 
a, a new wiki, like a work instruction, a task, whatever you want to call it now. I'm in SharePoint 2013 Foundation. Uh, I've set up a hosted version here. And I've already uh, pre-created uh, pre some of these lists. So you would need to do this from scratch, obviously. But um, for the sake of this session, I've already created one. So I've got one here called I Would Like To. Okay, that's my, that's a wiki list. Could be called procedures, could be called tasks, could be called how to, whatever the case may be. So let's click on this link, the I would like to link. Okay, so that brings up uh, a list of wiki pages. Now I've already created some, um, just so that you can see what's there. Uh, we're going to create a new one. So let's go on to new wiki page. Okay, now for this scenario, I'm going to play the role of a marketing manager. So I'm a marketing manager. I work for a SharePoint consulting company. I've just been to a social media seminar and I'm all hyped up now about Twitter. I'm thinking, how can we use Twitter to look for more sales opportunities and to promote our organization? So I'm going to create a new little how-to topic called promote the company using Twitter. Okay, so that's the name of this wiki. Right, so it's created a new wiki page. Um, this is again, as I say, in 2013, you've got the, the ribbon up here, you've got the editing here. So in my opinion, one of the big improvements with 2013, it's a much better, better user interface. Which again, it's uh, lowering the barriers to entry. So it would be much easier now for people to learn how to do this uh, rather than SharePoint 2010 and, and earlier it was a bit of a battle really just to even get people to create wikis. So here we are in editing mode and I'm going to write a few instructions now for how to create um, or how to promote our organization using Twitter. Okay, I already had some uh, pre-recorded text that I've pasted in there. So this is our little wiki here. To promote our organization using Twitter, there's a couple of do's there, monitor the tweets and some don'ts. Now, of course, you could provide more detailed information around this, but you get the general idea. So as the marketing manager, I'm really excited to share this information with everyone else. So I've quickly got back to my desk, sat down, and I've done this in about five or 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, then I save our wiki. So I click on the save. Okay, and that's saved the page, promote the company using Twitter. Now, the second step is we need to add the metadata to this uh, wiki page. So I'll go into the wiki list again, the I would like to list. And we need to edit the properties of this particular wiki. Okay, now I've already set up uh, some properties or some metadata for this particular uh, I would like to list. I'll just go through them. Before I fill them in, I'll just go through them. So we've got a description so we can get a bit more information about uh, the wiki, the how-to. I've also got, some, also got some fields here, how long, how often, hours per week. So often uh, when people go on conferences or they get excited and they want to introduce a new procedure, they don't take into account how this is going to affect existing workload. So what we can do in this case we can say, okay, how long does it take to complete this task? It's going to take us, uh, let's say, half an hour, so 0.5 of an hour to to monitor Twitter for opportunities. How often are we going to do it? Let's, uh, how often are we going to do it per week? Let's say we do it each day, so five days per week. So five times half an hour, so it's two and a half hours a week. We're going to need to commit to this. So as the marketing manager, maybe now I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, I've got to find two and a half hours. Uh, I'm going to have to stop doing something else. So having these metadata fields here, how long, how often, hours per week, gives you a bit of control, a bit more control over what you spend your time on. Okay, we've got the title here. Now we can uh, add related tasks. So any other I would like to that I've created that are related to this topic, we can select them here. So I'm going to add one, which is edit an article in Wikipedia. This is an instruction for how to edit an article in Wikipedia, believe it or not. So I'm going to add it as a related task. I'll talk a bit more about this later on. Now some other fields here. We've got who. Very important. And I'll show you why shortly. So who does this task? So as the marketing manager, I want to do it. But also I've spoken with the administrator. Uh, and I've also spoken with the manager of the administrator. And we've agreed, OK, let's get the administrator can do this task. They've got a spare two and a half hours. Let's add them to our list. OK, so we've nominated who is going to 
do this task? When does it get done? Oh, well, let's do it the first thing every morning. And there's some other metadata. Now, if you remember those different content types I spoke about, so we've got our how-tos at the center of our strategy. We've got web pages, documents, processes, lists, tools, all this other content type to support this particular task. And you choose which ones are needed. So in this case, we've got a related tool or an app, which is Twitter. So we're going to add that to our task. And we've got a watch change. I'll talk about a bit more about that later on. Okay, so once we've completed that metadata, we click the save. Right, so once we've clicked save, we're back in our I would like to list, and we've got our wiki here, promote the company using Twitter. Now you'll notice this particular view, and I'm assuming most people watching are familiar with lists in SharePoint. We've got our column headings here, so we've got who does it, we've got our related tools, related tasks, and we can filter those headings if we like. Uh, now that's it. So as far as I, the marketing manager goes, um, I've taken 10 minutes and I've created a new little FAQ, a little work instruction, whatever you want to call it. I've added some metadata. Now in terms of my involvement, uh, that's it. Unless this procedure changes, and I'm going to talk about that shortly, there's nothing else I need to do. So remembering one of the guidelines for getting people to contribute content more was to make it easy and simple for people to, to, to create content. A 5 or 10 minute job, seriously. So that's it. With SharePoint 2013, uh, as I said, the interface is much easier. There's no reason why you can't have most of your staff doing something just like I did then. Okay, so what I've done now in my intro wiki is I've created one wiki page now. <clears throat> I'm not the marketing manager anymore, I'm an end user. Let's say I'm the administrator, for example. How am I going to find this bit of information? How am I going to know now that I need to do this task? Okay, my manager may have come to me and said, okay, we've got a new task for you to do. We want you to start looking at Twitter every morning. But imagine there are 100 people that are doing this role. Imagine we're at a call center and we've created a new task that we need to let all these people know about. Probably what would happen in most organizations, maybe an email would come out. Okay, from now on, we want everyone to do this. Um, you may have a staff instruction manual, you know, page 400 pages long, page 38 gets updated, something like that may happen. So what we can do, so how do I find this information now as the administrator manager, as the administrator? Okay, there's a couple of ways. I can come directly to this I would like to page and I can filter by topic. Or a much better way is to search by topics by role. So I've created another list here called roles. Let's click on that list. This brings up a list of roles that I've already created within the organization. Now, if you imagine your own organization, this would be all the roles that occur within your organization. So it could be dozens, it could be hundreds, depending on how big your company is. So I've got a few example ones in here. Now, if I click on the administrator role, it brings up a page that has some I would like to's, which are related to me. It's got some tools and applications, and it's got a schedule. So it's got all the information that's been tagged with administrator as the as the property, as the metadata. If you remember that, who does this task? Uh, as long as we choose administrator, it'll appear in our list. So we can see, promote the company using Twitter. There's the wiki page that we just created. Uh, we've also got a schedule over here. Remember we chose first thing in the morning, it's when we're going to do this task. Here's our little schedule, promote the company using Twitter. So even once I've done this task once or twice and I already know how to, you know, how to use Twitter, this still is a handy little schedule to remind me of what I need to do each day as a way of uh, getting people to come and, and use your site to use SharePoint. So th there are two ways that I've shown you of getting to that site. Now there could be dozens of other ways that you might want to um, create as well, different views. For example, you could have most popular tasks, you could have recently updated tasks. You know, using all that metadata, which is very powerful within SharePoint, uh, you can provide different ways of accessing the information. But setting up a role-based view, which is what this is, is the best way that I've seen in aggregating content that's relevant to a particular role. Right, so I mentioned before how you can also use this approach to break down silos within organization. Now, one way of doing that is to use the Amazon approach. That is, uh, when you read a book in Amazon, it suggests other books that you might want to read that you may not have known about. So we can do something similar in, in SharePoint using this approach.
So for example, we've got our new task here, promote the company using Twitter. Now I want to create a connection or a link to this task here, adding links to social media sites from blog posts. So they're related. So I want to edit this particular wiki. I want to edit the properties. So I scroll down to the related tasks and I find the task that I want to add, which is promote the company using Twitter. I add that. Save. I want to go back to the administrator page, so I've got a link here, I'll click on that. Right, now if I go to the web page for promote the company using Twitter, so I select the link. Okay, we've got our text over here on the left that we wrote. Now this is a template, so this is a wiki page template that, um, that we've developed. Over here we've got the properties. That, are, that we set up, they're available in a little uh, list here and you'll see down here under C also we've now got that task that I just added, adding links to social media sites. So this is one way, as I say, of breaking down the size and letting people know about what other information is available out there. Now th these are all linkable by the way, so if I click on this link it'll take me directly to that task and then I can go to another task if I want. Okay, now the last thing that I want to demonstrate is how you might go about implementing change within your organization. Now what will happen traditionally when a new, uh, when a process changes, you know you'll get an email, people will be word of mouth, uh, it'll be a fairly ineffective way of letting people know about change. Now what you can do using an intra wiki, using this approach, is actually link the change to the task. So I'll show you what I mean. Let's go to the administrator view. Go to promote the company using Twitter again. Edit the properties. Now if I scroll down, I've got a I've got a task here. What's changed? So let me just type something in. Just anything will do. A recent change. Okay, use Twitter, let's say, send three tweets a day, something like that. All right, so I'm the marketing manager. I've come in, I've decided we need to tweet more often, so I've made that as a change, and I've updated this little what's changed text box. Save. If I go back to the role page. Now, what I want to do on this page is add a new web part to show me the recent changes. Okay, so I need to edit the page. Right, so I want to insert a new web part. Insert web part that I would like to add. Okay, so I've added my web part. Now I need to edit the web part. So it only displays the last three work instructions that have changed. So edit the view. Now I only want the name of the work instruction to appear as well as a little description of what's changed. Uh, when it's sorted by date last modified, okay it's already in that order and I just want the last three items displayed. Uh, we'll say okay. And the last thing I want to do is change this topic from I would like to to something a bit more useful. Called recent changes. Save the page. Okay, so this is our roll page now. I've just added a new web part called Recent Changes. And you'll see here you've got the last three modified wiki pages along with a description of what's changed. So you can see this roll page here, it contains really all the information that that person in that role needs to do their job.
Okay, so that's the that's the end of my session. Uh, just to recap, we went through three parts. The first one, I spoke a little bit about the Worldwide Internet Challenge and some of the research that I found from that. Uh, one of the main thing being that people really don't like to be engaged with SharePoint, don't like to contribute content. Um, then we looked at some of the reasons why that might be the case, and one of them is they're just not that interested. Uh, another reason is they're not sure of what sort of content they should be contributing. So we looked at some of the content types. Uh, we worked out that how-to type content is perhaps the most important type of content that people can contribute. So we looked at that, we looked at a lot of the research. The second uh, part of this session, we then went through a methodology or an approach about how we can implement a solution to that problem within an organization. I call it the intra wiki, but it's kind of using some of the lessons learned from Wikipedia within your organization. Then the third part of the session that we went through then was a demonstration using SharePoint Foundation 2013, uh, how you might go about implementing uh, a Wikipedia-like solution in your organization. Now we really just touched on it, you know, very at a very high level. Obviously, you need to set up the list, you need to set up all the, the metadata, you need to set up the values, you need to create relationships. Uh, these things I, I went through through the methodology. And as I said earlier on, this this whole process, I think you could get it set up in two to three weeks. Uh, of course, getting the content, getting the engagement, getting people involved, the change management, the training, all of that will take a lot longer, but getting the basic um, systems in place is uh, is a fairly straightforward task, I think. So there you go, that's the end of my session. I've really enjoyed presenting and uh, looking forward to seeing some of, the, uh, some of the other sessions on SP24. Uh, thanks again to Mark Jones from Calabras for uh, allowing me to present and uh, let me know if you've got any questions. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.